This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. We are discussing with defense attorney Ari Shamilian the Ellen Greenberg story. The absurdity of it, but I want to hear from a defense attorney perspective, what exactly may have gone down here that prevented just simple reality to from making it to the documentation of the death of Ellen Greenberg on the death certificate. It reads suicide. Although, of course, we know no one can stab themselves 20 times, including post-mortem. That's just not a thing. But it still remains, and it seems to be a extremely crazy uphill battle for the parents of Ellen Greenberg to make this argument. It really just defies logic with her being stabbed 20 sometimes. The family now simply on a mission, not even necessarily to find the killer. They even said that to me directly when I interviewed them the other week. It's just get the ruling changed from suicide to either undetermined or homicide. So a proper investigation can take place. We, we've we examined why this has not happened yet. It seems to be a lot of politics. It seems to be a lot of somewhat shady things going on uh, within the Philadelphia Police Department and uh, other law enforcement there, uh, as well as just the, the, the system itself. How does something like this get righted uh, and at least get on the track for a fair evaluation. They're doing it right. The family is getting uh, pressure built up against the police department, the coroner's office and the media. They're gaining support. It's definitely an unusual situation where you have a medical examiner initially say, yeah, this is a homicide. And all of a sudden say, oh, we take that back. It's a suicide. So garnering public attention in the media is going to spark that interest for them to take a closer look and potentially change the classification from suicide to a homicide. But the biggest issue that the city is facing right now is that if they do it in Miss Greenberg's case, they're worried they're going to open a door to hundreds of thousands of other cases And that's something where I think they don't want to open that door yet. Is that why you think it's been held back for so long and this family has been sitting there struggling, just pointing out the obvious mishandling of this whole case and they don't want to do it because, well, guess what? Maybe we mishandled a a ton of other cases too. And we certainly don't want to look like that. Yeah, I I think that's a big factor for the the government, the coroner's office, the police department. If they were to go back and reclassify, a bunch of other doors are going to open for other cases. You know, this type of scenario where the coroner has ruled something as a suicide uh, rather than homicide happens very frequently. I've I've been on other cases where, you know, it was a police officer that they said was a self-inflicted gunshot wound while the boyfriend was there in the other room. And the family tells me, Ari, there's no way that she would want to end her life. She has X, Y, Z planned out. It's very similar in this case. Miss Greenberg sent a save the date note for her wedding. She's in the middle of making food, right? She calls her children of her students. You know, she's a first grade teacher calls to make sure that everyone gets home safe. And then all of a sudden goes and does this a lot of it doesn't add up. So, you know, I I think the coroner's office knows there's something fishy going on here, but they want to, you know, push it all the way to the end before they open this can of worms. What is the end? The family dying and stopping putting pressure on them? I guess what is the end for something like this? Legal recourse, you know, maybe filing a lawsuit, you know, and I don't know what type of lawsuit this would fall into, but there's definitely going to be some type of specific performance or some type of order you could get to reevaluate the body Mm -hmm. and maybe have an independent coroner do further analysis, which they're already doing. There's multiple people that have came out and said, listen, some of these wounds are post-mortem. That means the person is dead and then these wounds get inflicted. Mm -hmm. That means someone else did it. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. So I I think they're there. They're, They're getting there. But 
you know, the, the bigger thing that's interesting about this case is if they go back and reclassify this from a suicide to a homicide, anyone could be potentially a suspect, even the, the fiance and the statute of limitations for murder in Philadelphia is life. So they could definitely still bring a murder charge, assuming they're able to get mm-hmm. enough evidence to convince a jury that he is the one that did it. And I would be very nervous if I were him, whether I did it or not, because the, there is a lot of things that are very fishy about the whole situation. And I think one of the most damning pieces of evidence that does not work into the favor of her ex-fiance uh, is that 911 call. It is one of the most bizarre 911 calls I have ever heard. Have you had a chance to listen to it? I haven't, but I'll tell you what, that there's two things that really struck out to me in this case. Yeah. Number one, magically for 45 minutes, he goes to go to the gym and comes back and finds her dead, right? Yep. That, that was very unusual. And the second thing is the attorney general's connections to the family and them being donors <laughs> where there's a conflict of interest very clearly there. Right? Yes. How are you going to have a prosecutor that's accepting donations from the suspect's family? Clearly, it's a conflict of interest, and he should have recused himself and had someone neutral there. That, and you also had his uncle, who's a very high-power attorney, show up at the house and take all of their uh, digital devices, uh, phones, computers, and just took them and <laughs> the next day. And then eventually they were returned uh, many, 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 many months later uh, to the Greenberg family. But, uh, you know, probably been wiped. There's not much left to be found on them. Uh, That in itself looked extremely suspicious. Why is your attorney showing up at the crime scene the next day taking digital (laughs) evidence? But it was because at that moment they were not looking at it as a homicide. Uh, But still, that actually would technically, uh, I believe, would have been actually theft if you're taking those items. But I suppose uh, with the the ex still alive at that moment in time, he could have probably given consent and said, yes, go ahead and take these uh, items with you. Uh, But some of them did belong to Ellen and her family. Uh, The family flat out saying that that was actually robbery without getting consent on it, uh, considering they were not married yet. Right. You know, as a defense attorney, I've been on scenes of crimes. You know, I've been there with my clients to obtain property, obtain evidence. That way we could use it. God forbid criminal charges come. Mm -hmm. I think this goes back to a bigger problem where the police and the coroner's office didn't do an adequate investigation. They didn't protect the scene. And that's the first thing you do as a police officer is you protect the scene. You get your search warrants. You collect anything that could potentially be evidence, and they fail to do that here. It almost feels like they were instructed not to protect the scene. Yeah, and that's kind of that goes back to what I told you earlier about the relationship between the attorney general yeah. and the donations between the potential suspect's family. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they were instructed. I don't. I wouldn't go as bold as that to say they weren't instructed, but something wasn't done a uh, protocol correctly here. And I, I think any officer that follows proper protocols knows to clear the scene, preserve the scene and collect all evidence. And this far into this now where it was never really looked at as a homicide from an investigative standpoint, that puts the investigation uh, at a very large disadvantage because the evidence is far long gone. There's only certain things we can look at at this point that are fairly circumstantial uh, to prove p- probability at this point. But I don't know that we're ever going to see beyond a reasonable doubt with anyone because we don't have that evidence unless there's something hiding somewhere that really, truly uh, you know, matches that up and connects A to B. And that's the sad thing about this case. The defense is going to argue if this thing ever goes to trial against someone, they're going to bring the coroner that did the examination and ask, isn't it true you saw the body when this was fresh? Isn't it true you were there on the scene and you took these photos? Isn't it true you were the one in charge of this investigation? Isn't it true if there's anyone that could have made this suicide determination, you would be the best person? And it stops there. 
Because the answer is yes. Yeah. The person that was there that did this and, and saw it firsthand is in the best spot to classify it. So that creates doubt. You know, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you heard it from someone that was there firsthand based on the evidence of that night. They thought this was suicide, not a murder. Yeah, un- until they actually did some examination and then determined and then initially determined it was a homicide. But then the police specifically, those are the ones who got this thing changed. Going back to the medical examiner and saying, we need you to change that to hom- uh, to, uh, to suicide, uh, not homicide. And they willingly did it. And then they very shortly thereafter left their position with the city. Yeah, sad situation. I, I really hope the family gets justice here and, and to the truth for sure. You're locked into the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.